The Nintendo 64 Expansion Pack is a piece of junk, almost completely useless and sold on a bed of lies. But I'm still gonna find a few awesome things with this little guy, because this is Punching Weight, a celebration of the weird, ambitious, and unnecessary, and the N64 Red Top here is all three of those things. So whether you're a hardcore collector or just interested in weird Nintendo peripherals, strap in because we are going to take a deep, deep dive into the Nintendo 64 Expansion Pack. But first, a shout out to our Patreon supporters. This is a Patreon supported show. Stick around to the end of the video to see all of the people that make this show possible. On with the show. So just what is the expansion pack? It is a peripheral that replaces the stock jumper pack and boosts the power of the Nintendo 64, doubling the RAM with an additional four megs of power. It's easy to think this is the product of a bygone era, like the Sega CD or the 32X. Yes, they made dual versions of that. But how different is it really from the Xbox One X, PlayStation 4 Pro, or S model iPhones? Well, except this is a hell of a lot cheaper. But really, this is classic Nintendo. They love upgrading their stuff. The NES Top Loader, the Super Game Boy, the DS, the 3DS, the new 3DS. Don't forget about all the Game Boys. I mean, the reason the Wii U failed was because everyone thought it was just a tablet upgrade for the Wii. Which, yeah, I guess in a way it was, but let's stay focused. The expansion pack was salvaged from the 64DD, meaning this thing was created for something entirely else. Perhaps this is why so few games used it, and those games that did didn't really benefit much from the extra juice. How do you use the expansion pack? Well, on the front of every system is a little hatch with a tiny cartridge. This is the jumper pack, AKA Terminator pack. I'm not kidding, that's what it actually says in Japanese on the front there. Pry that thing out with the official Nintendo plastic thingy, or failing that a screwdriver or table knife, and slide in the old red top and bam, your Nintendo 64 has now been supercharged. Except it hasn't. The sole purpose of the jumper pack is to allow the system to boot without the expansion pack. I'm not kidding, this thing might as well be empty. Now with it being designed this way, you'd think, naturally, most of the library supports it. So before we get into what the red top does, here's what it does not do. It does not improve any non-compatible game. It will not improve the frame rates of GoldenEye or Smash Bros or improve your Mario 64 speedrun. However, it functions like a normal jumper pack in those situations, so you don't need to worry about swapping packs, which Nintendo actually encourages you not to do. Though it's probably still worth hanging on to your original jumper pack just in case, more on that later. The Nintendo 64 expansion pack will also not tell you where to suck it, like Professional Wrestler X-Pack. So that covers the non-compatible games, what about the compatible games? In North America, just over 60 games are compatible with the Red Top. Now, I know that doesn't sound very impressive, hold on. It's actually even less impressive than that. The most common enhancement was an increase in resolution and texture quality, but at the cost of frame rate. Games would look better, but run worse. Bad news for a library of games that already had huge issues with Chug. You're usually better off leaving the high-res options alone. This is the case for most of the Turok and Star Wars games, as well as a few sports games. There are a few edge cases like South Park and Duke Nukem Zero Hour having the option to improve either the resolution or frame rate. Other games improve graphics in different ways. The World Is Not Enough, aka 007 TWINE, offers a high color mode, and Quake 264 offers more colors and a small bump to the frame rate. But some of these games are still N64 exclusives, so the extra graphical options are still an interesting little novelty. They're not really worth the getting into, but it's cool. However, a few compatible games were ported to other beefier systems like the Dreamcast, PS2, and PC, which today makes the graphics bump not as meaningful. But I'm sure at the time, it kept the N64 in the conversation as newer systems arrived on the market. In fact, the more I think about the expansion pack, the clearer it becomes that it was just marketing BS. Another example of gaming's tired but but still a marketable pursuit of graphics over everything. So I'll be honest, you'd be forgiven if you wrote this thing off completely, but digging deeper, the expansion pack still finds itself in the middle of some mysterious and fascinating stuff. So enough farting around, it's time to really get into the mud. The Red Top had a more interesting and complicated relationship with a handful of games, enough to justify its existence. Still wouldn't say this is one of Nintendo's best products, but 
Man, you know I love this kind of stuff. I had to make a video about it. And before we get too much further, for the record, we're capturing all gameplay footage off the original hardware with the standard composite cables. No emulation for this video. Not that we have any issue with emulation, but for this video, it was important to get the real thing, just for the sake of due diligence and journalism. And of course, we need to start our deep dive into the expansion pack with the three games that required it. DK64, Majora's Mask, and Perfect Dark. First off, DK64. Here in the States, it was the only N64 game bundled with the expansion pack. That's how I got mine. Elsewhere in the world, it was also bundled with Perfect Dark and Majora's Mask, but here in the States, it was only bundled with DK64. By itself, the expansion pack retailed for $30, maybe more depending on your region, which made the bundle a pretty good deal. It also came with a jumper pack ejector tool and an instruction book that referred to this hunk of plastic as the jumper pack ejector tool. Yeah, that snazzy red top doesn't actually make it any easier to remove from the system. For fun, here's what DK64 looks like when you try and play it with the jumper pack. Yep, just this screen and nothing else. Could've at least let us listen to the DK rap. DK64 was advertised as a game so massive it needed the expansion pack just to fit it all in. It's so big we included an expansion pack to get it all in. And it was a really big game, many would argue too big, but it also housed some fancy lighting and decent frame rate. However, it's worth noting that Rare's follow-up platformers Banjo-Tooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day, released in 2000 and 2001 respectively, were also pretty massive games with impressive graphics that not only didn't require, but didn't even use the expansion pack. So what gives? DK64 was Nintendo's big holiday game for 1999. Nintendo expected it to do Ocarina of Time numbers and was given a massive advertising budget. The advertising was effective. All this time, I genuinely thought it was so big it needed the expansion pack to run. This is the first game to require the use of the N64 expansion pack. Yeah, 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 but it just turns out that was all marketing spin. In reality, there was a game-breaking bug that Rare could not fix. The real reason DK64 required the expansion pack was that it was an easier fix for this bug if it randomly crashed the game. It was a costly solution, but Nintendo needed their holiday hit, delaying the game was out of the question. And also, the expansion pack didn't even fix the bug, only severely mitigated it. If left on for upwards to 10 hours, the game will still crash. This really isn't a problem for N64 owners, however, for emulation and virtual console players, using save states instead of saving and exiting the game like you normally would, this is still a problem. The bug is apparently due to memory leakage, and may have been the result of an unseasoned development team within Rare. It's true that that Rare as a company made some incredible games for the system, but for most of the DK64 development team, this was their first N64 game. According to some serious tea spilled by the members of the Conker's Bad Fur Day team, their game didn't need the expansion pack because they did a much better job optimizing the graphics than the DK64 team. Donkey Kong 64, they did use it, didn't they? It Indeed they did. Which yeah. means that we they did had it. to use it. Which means that we did a much better job. Yeah. I'm optimizing the yeah, game. There's also no, a good story behind why that happened. <laughs> Whew, damn, that is some serious shade. Anyway, this leaves us in two places. Either the expansion pack just fixes the bug, or it does more than fix the bug. If the problem solely was the bug, then technically DK64 can run with the standard jumper pack. Theoretically, if some genius could hack the system with a game shark or something like that, or get around the check for the expansion pack at startup, the game would run just fine. I mean, it would probably still crash all the time, but if it's true that it just fixed the bug, it shouldn't need the extra RAM to run, and the expansion pack is even more useless than I thought. But here's what I can't figure out. DK64 was released November 1999, but the announcement that it would require the expansion pack came in May, six months earlier. Six months! And there's no telling when that decision was made internally at Nintendo. Now, I'm no programmer, but that's not exactly the 11th hour. If the expansion pack just fixes the bug, that means with at least six months of development left, nobody said, well, since we have to use the expansion pack, might as well beef up the graphics and frame rate while we're at it. Now, it's totally possible that no one said that, but when the truth came out about the bug, the world seemed to declare, okay, case closed, but there are still mysteries yet to be solved with DK64. And one last thing, people are too harsh on this game. It definitely ain't no masterpiece and probably the weakest of Rare's N64 platformers, but this deserves a remaster and a second chance. Moving on, another game that requires the expansion pack, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. 
Majora's relationship with the Red Top isn't as juicy as DK64's, but it's still really interesting. And again, for funsies, here's what it looks like when you boot it up with the jumper pack. It's weird how some of the text is blurry. It's just text. What's the deal? The Legend of Zelda and the Expansion Pack go way back. Both Zelda 64s were at some point planned for the ill-fated disc add-on the 64DD, which like I stated earlier is what the Expansion Pack was originally made for. However, like a lot of 64DD games, Ocarina shipped without Expansion Pack support. Though there are beta versions of Ocarina that require the Expansion Pack, though they may have been tech demos for the slightly improved GameCube version as evidenced by the 2003 copyright on the title screen. For a hot minute, there was a third Zelda project, separate from Majora's Mask, an expansion for Ocarina called Uda Zelda for the 64DD. Expansions are what they used to call DLC, children! From the ashes of Uda Zelda rose the Master Quest mode, which found its way to a port on the GameCube and the 3DS remake. Now, what does any of this have to do with the follow-up Majora's Mask? Majora runs on the Ocarina engine and reuses a ton of assets, so I've never understood why exactly this game requires the expansion pack. And listen, what I mean by that is it's clear what the expansion pack does to Majora's Mask. Its graphical improvements over Ocarina are numerous and well documented. However, why was the expansion pack not optional? The closest explanation I can find is that Majora had a very short development time. The story goes that because Ocarina took four years to make, Shigeru Miyamoto wanted a fast turnaround for the next Zelda game. Eiji Aonuma was given the baton and made Majora's Mask in just one year. Even reusing the Ocarina engine and its assets, it's possible the team didn't have the time to make Majora optimized for the jumper pack. But I think it's deeper than even that. It needed the extra RAM for its landmark time mechanic. The world of Majora's Mask is filled with dozens of NPCs, and keeping track of their location and your progress with their side missions at all times was a massive memory hog. I imagine it's similar to how the PS3 and 360 versions of Shadow of Mordor have a greatly reduced nemesis system because those previous generation systems just don't have the specs. I think it's possible that Majora is the inverse of DK64. Aonuma knew that the time mechanic wouldn't be possible without the extra RAM, so they improved the visuals while they were at it. This is one of the few times the expansion pack was used to push the limits of gameplay, not just graphics. Uh, or maybe I'm just stretching here, but wouldn't it be just like Nintendo to be the only ones who knew how to properly use their hardware? At any rate, despite requiring the red top, Majora's Mask still sold well, though not quite as well as Ocarina. And even though it was a divisive game for fans at the time, from here Aonuma would become the shepherd of the Legend of Zelda series for Nintendo. Even though it's probably the smartest and best use of the expansion pack, Majora is still a little rough around the edges. The best way to play this game today is on the 3DS remake. Still, die-hard Majora fans need to recognize that without this little buddy here, we would have never had this game. Next, it's Perfect Dark. Now, when I said that there are three games that require the expansion pack, that's not exactly true. Huge portions of this game are inaccessible without the extra memory, but you still can play Perfect Dark on a jumper pack. That's even advertised on the box. 65% of this game requires the expansion pack. This is not the only game to do this, we'll get to that in a second, but it's without a doubt the most well-known example. Now, it might look like there's next to nothing you can do without the expansion pack, but that's not true! Booting up with the jumper pack grants you access to the small but perfect menu. <laughs> yeah, that's that classic rare humor for you, which lets you play one of the most robust multiplayer modes in the history of video games. You're only allowed two human players, but you can still fill matches with eight computer bots. There are so many guns, levels, modes of play. For my money, this is the real star of Perfect Dark. So what if you can't do four player split screen? You can still get dumb as hell with eight bots and nothing but end bombs, baby. Yeah, just look at this unplayable mess. It's so beautiful. So the expansion pack is optional, but you can still have a hell of a time without one. With the expansion pack, though, you are allowed four-player in the combat simulator, as well as access to all things related to the single-player campaign, including the cooperative and still almost one-of-a-kind counter-operative mode. And of course, you also have the option to change the screen size, resolution, and aspect ratio, but no setting keeps this game from some serious chug action. Like we pointed out in previous episodes, once you've played the HD version on XBLA or in Rare Replay, there's just no going back. It's such an enormous improvement, but few games push the limits of not just the N64, but any console, like Perfect Dark, and watching this game struggle to run on an actual N64 is still a thing of wonder. But well, hold on, here's something that I think holds the HD versions back. If you're playing on Xbox, 
you cannot play multiplayer with guests. All players have to have an Xbox Live account to play any form of multiplayer. No combat simulator, no co-op, no counter-op. It's stupid! What if me and my friends are drunk and just want to play now? What if most of us bought PS4s and don't remember our Xbox emails and passwords? What's wrong with guests? You know what you need to play multiplayer on an N64? Extra controllers and maybe the expansion pack. That's it. God, the future can be lame sometimes. And Perfect Dark isn't the only game that hides huge portions of its game behind the expansion pack. StarCraft 64 requires it to play the Brood War campaign, which is fitting as that was the PC game's expansion, and the multiplayer. I know that doesn't sound like a big deal. I mean, if you want to play StarCraft and Brood War, it's very available on PC. But the big deal here is the split-screen multiplayer. Now, for some of you, the idea of split-screen StarCraft sounds absurd, but like I pointed out in earlier episodes, it's pretty damn unique. StarCraft, when you and your opponent can see each other's screens, drastically changes the multiplayer dynamic. And you can only get that with the N64 expansion pack. Furthermore, it is damn impressive how well this game actually plays on an N64 controller. I really can't say enough how mind-bogglingly good this game is. And this is now the third time we've mentioned StarCraft 64 in a video! We did it! Oh, I never thought we'd get here, people! Oh, I'm so happy. I just... Oh, I'm so thankful. I just wanna... I just wanna thank my parents. Next up, another N64 technical marvel, Resident Evil 2. As expected, the expansion pack adds more texture detail, but nothing that'll make you toss out your PlayStation 1 version. We've read claims of higher resolution cutscenes, but... Eh. Look, it's still a miracle, the cutscenes were all somehow crammed into this cartridge, but I couldn't spot any differences, so nothing too exciting, I know, but I only bring this up because we discovered something odd about Resident Evil 2 64. When we mentioned this game on our Resident Evil 2 episode of Punching Weight, we came across a production problem. With the expansion pack, the game shifts resolutions constantly, sometimes when moving to a new camera angle, or sometimes when opening and closing the menu, and every time, our capture card cut the video feed for a few seconds to readjust, making it impossible to play, especially in the very beginning. We needed a jumper pack to get footage, but I didn't think to take the jumper pack out of storage because why would I ever need my jumper pack ever again? It actually been sitting in the same place for the last 20 years inside my DK64 box. We had to buy another jumper pack because look, every time the footage grays out or skips ahead a few seconds, the video is cutting out. Every time you see that, I'm flying completely blind for a few seconds. It was so frustrating, but there must be some impressive behind-the-curtain tech running this game because no other N64 game we tested had this many graphical shifts, and we think that's actually pretty awesome. Also, I found out that some jumper packs come with stickers and some don't. So thank you for almost derailing an entire episode of Resident Evil 2 64, but you're a fascinatingly weird game and we love you. Oh, and on the topic of games where the expansion pack gave me some trouble, here's a fun little aside, Space Station Silicon Valley. This cult favorite platformer from the people that would one day give us GTA 3 is not expansion pack compatible, but will still sometimes crash with the expansion pack. Again, usually games that don't support the expansion pack play no differently with the expansion pack, but Space Station Silicon Valley is the only game with this problem as far as we could tell, which is good news because all this time I thought something was wrong with my cart. Okay, we're getting down to the end here. Next, we're gonna look at three Midway games where the red top does more than just improve the graphics. Hydro Thunder, Gauntlet Legends, and San Francisco Rush 2049. The expansion pack is required to play Gauntlet Legends with more than two players and Hydro Thunder with more than three players. I think this is kind of interesting because both of these games were also released on the Dreamcast, a system that also had four controller ports. However, Hydro Thunder on the Dreamcast is only two players. Now, years later, Hydro Thunder would appear on Midway Arcade Treasures 3 for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox, but the version in this bundle is apparently just a port of the Dreamcast version, which means the N64 expansion pack version is the only one with a four-player mode. I never felt compelled to own the N64 port of Hydro Thunder. You're looking at the Dreamcast version here, by the way. But after learning this little factoid, I think I might have to track this version down. As for Gauntlet Legends, while the box says it's designed for the expansion pack, it doesn't explicitly say it's required for three or four players, which must have ruined at least a few game nights back in the day. And lastly, San Francisco Rush 2049. An entire track and racing circuit is locked without the expansion pack, plus changeable rims and music in arcade races. In this instance, you're probably better off just getting the Dreamcast version or playing it on the Midway Arcade Treasures 3 compilation I just mentioned. 
And there's a bunch of other trivia, like the PAL exclusive F1 World Grand Prix 2, a game I've never played myself, apparently requires the expansion pack to view full race replays. I read on Wikipedia that Shadowgate 64 has unlisted expansion pack support, but I tested that for myself, and there are no graphical options in the game, and I didn't notice any difference. That's Wikipedia for you. NBA Jam 2000 mentions jaw-dropping ultra-high-res graphics on the back of the box, but doesn't indicate that without an expansion pack, your jaw will remain undropped. Revolt unlocks a medium resolution mode with the expansion pack, which doubles the resolution. However, with a cheat code, you could unlock an even higher quality, but I don't have a copy myself, so I couldn't say if that makes it look or run better than the Dreamcast version. And that just about covers it, so I want to say thank you so now much- Now wait just a damn minute there, Derek. Wait a minute, that voice sounds familiar. You weren't thinking of wrapping this thing up without uh, mentioning a little thing called the Turok Games? Oh, hello there, Mr. McMuscles. And, well, yeah, all the Turok Games do is increase the graphics, but at the cost of the frame rate. And those games already ran kind of shitty. <sighs> Derek, 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 sweet child. You're not thinking punching weight enough. You're forgetting that the Turok games have cheats. Cheats that mess with the graphics. And there's some fun to be had. And besides, you're always fucking ragging on Turok games and everyone dislikes that. Allow me to grab grab the wheel from you for, for just a minute. All right, fine, Matt. Hit him with that Turok dinosaur hunter knowledge. Okay, look, there are four Turok games released on the N64, and they were the best. And all but the first one used the expansion pack, not that they needed it. And for the record, Mr. Alexander didn't mention this at the top, but Turok 2 Seeds of Evil, released late October 1998, was the first game to support the expansion pack, edging out, you know, the pretenders like Quarterback Club 99, Top Gear Overdrive, FIFA, all that shit, even Star Wars Rogue Squadron by a few weeks, at least in North America. Okay, fine, I'll give you that. Turok 2, Turok 3, and the spin-off Rage Wars offered the expected high-res mode, which, yeah, makes the graphics sharper, but the games run slightly slower. It doesn't have cheats that improve graphics, like Revolt. You can still have some fun comparing stuff like the pen and ink mode cheat, aka Polygon mode, and the Grad mode cheat, aka Texture Map mode, switching between high and low res with the expansion pack and comparing the differences. Ink and paper mode, especially, is a cool peek behind the curtain, a clearer sense of just how much the expansion pack is improving the visuals. It's mind-blowing. I really wish the PS4 or modern PCs could keep up with this tech. Oh wow, that is really cool. But, you know, it is about time to wrap up, and now that you're here, I think I know just how to do it with the most hilarious expansion pack compatible game. Die Katana? Ooh, close, but no. Xena Warrior Princess. You actually own Xena Warrior Princess. I mean, I don't, but I know someone who does. Um, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Derek. Matt, we are doing important work here, please. The world needs to know, does the expansion pack make Xena Warrior Princess the greatest game ever made? Well, you ended the Nintendo 64 mouse video with Superman 64. We need another showstopper for this video. Another Titus joint, Xena Warrior Princess. Ooh, the talisman of fate, so fancy. All right, Matt, what are we looking at here? Xena is a fighting game, a 3D fighting game. Oh, wow, there aren't too many of those on the N64. That's pretty cool. Well, it's, it's kind of a fighting, it's, it's barely kind of a game, because, let, let's just play it. Oh, hell yeah, main girl, Xena Warrior Queen. And ladies and gentlemen, I think a storm is brewing. It's a fight. Wow, and right out of the gate, Xena is playing the mind games. Xena got her completely confused with this technique here. Yeah, no, Derek, I concur. This is a really sound strategy. You can't beat this. Oh, wow, wow, we haven't seen this technique done since... And now she's backing away to let the clock run out. This this is a sound strategy here. Absolutely, Matt. Bold. Bold, bold strategy. Bold. Very bold. Bold Very strategy bold. here. Matt, would you say this is a bold strategy here? Ooh, that's a bold strategy here. And again with the mind games. Oh my gosh, just jumping and jumping in all my years of broadcasting. I've, I've never seen such command over the ring. Now, now this, is, this is a really great tactic by her. She's going to do... Five, yeah. Uh, three, nothing. Two, that, that's good. That's one. good, too. Matt, does this game still suck? Yep. 
right on. Thanks for watching, everybody. Check out Matt's channel. He is currently working through an amazing eight-part retrospective on the Prince of Persia games. It's over on Matt's Flophouse. You are watching Stop Skeletons and Fighting. We are a Patreon-supported show. Huge shout out to all of the wonderful people that you see on the screen right here. They made this uh, video possible. You know who else made this video possible? Our friend Alex from S House Studios. Thank you for helping out with the edits. Again, to support the show at patreon.com, $1 goes a long way, but $2 gets you access to our activity feed and our private Discord. Check that stuff out. Thank you so much for the support. Thanks so much for watching. Stay powerful.